Hey guys, so I'm here with my buddy Nick Salles visiting from Marcelo Garcia's. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of training the last week on the crab ride. So Nick has a huge knowledge of the crab ride position. And I have a lot of people asking me to do videos on like the Matrix and Marambolos and stuff. And I felt like having him here, this was a great opportunity to go into it. So the thing with the crab ride is I would draw an analogy to like a triangle choke or an arm bar. It's kind of like a fundamental position that if you learn to finish it well, you can set it up from anywhere, right? So if you have a good triangle choke, then you can set it up from spider guard, from closed guard, from collar sleeve, from worm guard, there's all these different setups. So a crab ride is similar to that, right? Like you could set it up from a matrix, you could set it up from like a baby bolo, uh, you could set it up from like a fail baron bolo, you could set it up from top, but a lot of people don't know like kind of the fundamentals or like an overview of how to play the position. And after talking with Nick, it's like his knowledge in this position is unbelievable. So we're gonna use this time to allow him to go through and give you guys kind of a rough overview. She's a real specialist at working this inversion game, De La Hiva, through to using the back take from the crab ride. We're getting very close. So let's get started. We're going to be in the crab ride. So my partner can just be flat on her backs. And you might want to come right next to it. I'm going to get into the crab ride position. So the first thing I want to make sure is that I'm as close to the hips as possible. This is going to facilitate my transition under the hips. I'm going to want my feet behind the knees pinching in with mine okay I want to add pressure to the outside of this leg this is gonna allow us to create uh, action and reactions with my hands my hand positioning can be on the hips I can look to make far collar grips I can look to get the horse collar grip and this is gonna be all predicated on whether or not he's exposing the back or if he's flat on his back and deep bending this way I'm gonna want to have my chest and head close to the hips here, okay? Now, from the crab ride, what am I looking to do? I could spin under, sliding under his hips. I could be threatening the pass by pulling myself into a leg drag, right? And oftentimes this creates a reaction where maybe he's opening up his knee, which gives me a path to the back. Or we can always finish, right? And do a simple back take. I chair lift it. What I'm usually looking for is the elbow, uh, sorry, the, the space between his thigh and his torso, so this hip space here. And if I have access to the space, I can usually make a grip on the far lapel, okay? If he's not giving me access to the space by closing his elbow or turning onto his side, I'll usually opt for grabbing the horse collar grip. All right, let's say in this case, he's giving me this space so I'm gonna slide my hand through the space and grab the collar. The whole time, I'm pinching with my knees, making sure my elbow and knee is connected and keeping my head as close as possible. All right, once I'm in this position, it's easy to shrug and start inverting to the other side. And as I'm doing that, I'm gonna be stacking his hips by pushing my foot out, almost like I'm trying to touch his toes to the ground. And I'm gonna be looking to fixate his hips on top of mine. All right, from here, I'm gonna be able to replace this hook with my other foot, maintain the position. And now I can pull my hips under and fix my twister hook. All right, once my twister hook is fixed, I'm able to start shrimping out, get his hips closer towards the inside space so I can pass my leg over center him up. So again, for this specific attack, I'm looking for the space around his hips here. Okay, so I get into position. Maybe I start with my hands on the hip at first. I'm tight. I'm looking to control the far lapel. Now it's important that I don't keep my elbow open, that I'm keeping my elbow tight. 
right? Because if I keep my elbow tight, once I spin and I start pulling his hips onto me, this elbow is gonna prevent him from being able to pull his knee to his chest, okay? So if I didn't have this grip here, he can pull his knee to his chest, and now I can't get access to that space. So this is gonna keep the space open, so I can wedge in with my knee, get my hook inside. From here, all I'm looking to do is shrink out to create a better angle, and guide his hips in between my legs, so I can pull him onto my lap. Double unders or seat belt. Oftentimes, we get to this position, right? We invert, okay? And maybe we switch, and I'm trying to get this hook in, but he's denying it. Maybe he's pushing my leg out, right? So instead of going for a twister hook, I'm just gonna go back to what we call the flick hook and take the back this way. So oftentimes, if he's turning away from me, denying this hook, this space here will be accessible. So I can put my flick hook back in, I can grab the hip, I can start to pull his hip onto me, always looking to elevate, putting my heel inside, pulling him up, controlling from here. Again, up here, Let's spin through, boom, try to get this hook in, he's not letting me, I go back, all right? I prefer to have this grip on the near hip to toggle his hip towards my other leg, right? So I'm stacking him and I'm toggling his hip to pass it to my other foot, taking the back. The dilemma we're gonna have now is that he's gonna not be denying me this hip space here, okay? Maybe he's hand fighting. Oftentimes, they're trying to peel the bottom hook off, okay? And now, I'm gonna have back exposure. So instead of wasting time trying to grab the lapel or staying on the hips, I'm gonna go ahead and control the collar. For this motion, we're not gonna be inverting anymore. If I try to invert, it's gonna be hard to use the flick to get his hips to where I need him to be. So we're gonna to have to use a stronger action. I'm gonna to look to pivot and dive to the other side. As I'm pivoting, I'm looking to make the horse collar grip or any grip near the shoulder as close to the far shoulder as possible. So I don't wanna grab close to the near shoulder. I wanna grab closer to the far shoulder. Because when I pivot and stomp, this arm is gonna become the bottom arm. So I'm grabbing the collar as I'm pivoting, and this flick hook is gonna pass leg control off to my other leg. So oftentimes we're here, I'm gonna start looking away, and I'm gonna pass the control off to this leg. All right, this leg could be stomping, it could be blading to create leverage, Personally, I prefer to just externally rotate my knee, pass it off like so. From here, we're just looking to fit in the twister hook, okay? And this hand is on the hips, the other hand is on the collar. Got the hips down, seat belt. So I just want to talk about developing the crab right in general. Um, you know, developing positions in jiu-jitsu, each position is so in-depth, right? So like Nick has and Daniel have years of experience in this position. So it's like, it's almost like a whole, it's like being a musician, right? Like you can be good at the piano and know nothing about playing the drums, right? And so to develop positions like this fast, I really like to use specific training. So what I've been doing all week is just starting in the crab right position and trying to spar with people from there to get good at the finish sequence. 
To me, that's like analogous to like developing a good triangle choke. If you're trying to learn to play spider guard, but you don't have a good triangle choke, you're not gonna like be uh, motivated or incentivized to try to go for the triangle choke because you know that when you go for it, you're not gonna be able to finish it and you might even get passed, right? So for developing something like this, it's hard enough to set it up if you're trying to do a matrix or you're trying to set it up for open guard, but if you could just start in the position and learn to finish from there and go through all the variations and get experience, then you're gonna find that when you're playing in your open guard or even passing, that you can start setting it up and you have like the backbone and confidence in the position. Uh, in the next video, we're gonna have Daniel Myra, who may be in the video behind me there. Uh, he's gonna go into how to set it up on top sometimes, because sometimes like when you're passing, just get out of you know, you may be here, and we're always thinking of like guard passes, but there's a lot of easy ways to switch into the position from here and start dropping down and start building into the positions from here as well, right? So uh, to me, like uh, when you're trying to develop uh, your game, starting with the end first is the way I like to think of it. So you have like a strong triangle choke, a strong arm bar, uh, a strong collar choke, a strong little plata. I think having a very strong barren bolo and a very strong crab ride, if your body is flexible enough and like you have the right skill set to do, um, is like super foundational for an offensive game. Uh, a couple thoughts as well, because I know these guys are so experienced at it. Uh, for me developing the position, one of the biggest things that stood out to me was uh, how important like shelving the hip on your chest was, right? So like I think a lot of people when they're doing it, just start the right here, right? A lot of people when they're doing it, I think they have the feeling that like you're here, so I'm like up on my shoulder, that was another big thing. Like don't be on your neck, be on your shoulder. It's actually much easier on you as well. Um, is a lot of people you'll see doing this, they kind of have some distance between their chest and hips. And then even when they invert, they're here and they're kind of like, like leaving the guy here and inverting out here. So it might look like, like this, but here I just mirrored the same position on the other side, nothing really changed, right? But what I noticed from working with them is like when I'm on the hip and I'm tight here, the actual inversion process will load them on my hip. So I don't want to invert out here. I want to like invert underneath him. And that's what actually props them up. So when I'm here like this, that actual inversion creates this moment where I, I shelf him up, right? And then of course from here, we can do the twister hook finish. We have all sorts of different things we can do to try to finish from here. Um, which, you know, this was a loose overview and there's a lot more and I'm sure Nick will post stuff on his Instagram as well. Um, Nick, did you have any other thoughts about just developing it in general or? Yeah, I would say at first, just get used to maintaining the position. Don't worry so much about finishing attack when you're first learning it. You feel good, uh, just like John had mentioned, you can get this position from a plethora of different guards, outside bolos, inside bolos, leg entanglements like X guard, uh, waiter positions. So focus on getting to the crab from the positions you're already comfortable with and focus on just maintaining, staying sticky. Like John had mentioned, keep your chest closed, focus on keeping your hooks tight. And as you get comfortable doing that, then start experimenting with a few uh, finishes and get comfortable with that and then start building your game from there. But don't try to overwhelm yourself by learning seven different finishes and uh, your crab is not even as tight as it could possibly be. So focus on just maintaining the position and go, go from there. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, uh, like he's saying, like you can really view it almost like a guard in itself, right? It's like once you understand the position, it's not like there's just one finish. It's like a position that's spending a lot of time in. Like the little things he said, like like keeping your knees tight on the hips, keeping your hooks uh, kind of wide and the feet strong, all of those factors will play a large role, right? So experiment with it and uh, hopefully we do some more content on it soon. Uh, also, uh, you can follow Nick on Instagram uh, at that Nick Salas, T-H-A-T, Nick Salas, two L's. Right, and we'll put it in the description as well. As always, if you guys like the content, follow me on Instagram, at John Thomas, BJJ. And if you guys like the channel, the best way to help is like, share, subscribe. Thanks a lot. But yeah, I feel like one of the biggest things like with you guys developing it is there's not a ton of content out there on it. And I feel like you guys more or less just did a lot of like self-study and like watching a lot of competition video to develop it, right? Yeah, and plus we have the added resource that we trained Gianni Grippo. We're able to kind of troubleshoot a lot of these things in a realistic setting. Mm. Uh, because for us, we weren't able to just go on YouTube and search crab rides and barrel bows because the best crabbers and best bowlers in the world aren't showing that information. So for us, it was a lot about just troubleshooting with the teammates we have, uh, reflecting on what we know and do with the tape we're studying, and make those micro adjustments yeah. as needed. So a big thing like, you know, when you don't understand a position, there's nothing on it. Like, hey, go and study it. Go and try to find it for yourself and pick it apart. And a lot of people I feel don't do that. Um, it's uh, a habit.
having kind of some of those details come out, I feel like can, can really help, uh, you know, the, the new show and stuff. So uh, yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. I think um, as well, a big factor that we talk a lot about while you guys are here is a big factor with like you're developing your skills is like you're kind of somewhat um, limited or controlled by the people that you train with, right? So for example, if you want to develop worm guard passing, but no one in your gym plays worm guard, it's a bit tricky, right? Um, so, you know, in those cases, you need to really start using film study. That's a big thing a lot of people miss, is like, if no one in my gym plays worm guard, and I know in the tournament someone's gonna play worm guard, then I need to like watch video, learn something about worm guard myself, and have the person put me in that position, right? And I think like one of the big things with you guys being here is like we have like, you know, we didn't really train my, uh, well, we never really trained before you guys visited, right? And like, it's like we've been in two separate like uh, isolation chambers developing yeah. our separate skill sets. And then when we come together, we both have these positions or we're, we're developing, right? And it's really cool to see that exchange. And like uh, one thing I realized is how hard it is to defend something that you haven't had experience in, right? So the best thing to do while you guys are here is for us to like me spend as much time in the crab ride with you guys as possible. You guys spend as much time with me in like open guard and open guard passing positions as possible. Um, so I just like, yeah, those kind of things in general. Um, and then any last tips for like someone who wants to study this position mm -hmm. or learn it? Yeah, so when you're trying to figure these positions out, maybe you're doing a situational sparring uh, with your partner, make sure you're going slow. So if I have Danny here, and I'm trying to refine my crab rep, just spin this one out. And he's on his back. So, we start in crab. I'm gonna ask him, okay, give me reactions, but do so slowly. Don't just learn, like, watch this video and be like, all right, ready, go. And then your partner's just gonna spaz and kick out of it, right? So, there's a difference too between like, when you're doing that, if I'm going 100 miles an hour and he's going like 10 miles an hour, this is something that happens a lot. He's like, okay, ready, go. And then I go 100 miles an hour, and because he's not even going that hard, it's like maybe even a, a, an invalid escape might work because he's not even trying that much. So it's important to get the paces matched correctly. So we always go a little bit slower at first to figure it all out, and then we can start going harder and harder. Exactly. So I might be here and be like, all right, move really slow. I'm gonna just try to feel the position out, you know? Maybe he's starting to pull my bottom hook through. So I'm like, okay, I can't really invert. So what should I do? Okay. I should roll through. That's half, okay. Feel that out a couple times, maybe increase the tempo on that, and just start troubleshooting different positions from there, different hand positions. Feel comfortable doing them against someone who's moderately uh, uh, giving resistance, and then start applying it live. Yeah, I, I feel like the slow pacing, that was big for me, because I do have done a ton of specific sparring already. Obviously, you guys have seen long here. Um, and like, I think the utility of going like s slowing the tempo down is like super important. And it doesn't mean that your opponent gives you like silly reactions where they're not resisting and just being like a dead fish, but it means like they can slow down so you have time to process. Like one issue I was having was like in the beginning when I would start the crab ride is sometimes we'd be here and my opponent doesn't know much about the position. So the thing they would start doing was like stiff arming my like legs really hard, right? And that like caused a lot of problems in the beginning. And when we would go just like immediately like super fast, it, it happened so fast it was hard to process, right? But then like as we slowed it down, like we kind of realized, okay, if he pushes here, I can just grab the shoulder and start coming up directly to the back when he did that, right? But it took me like, I would have to freeze to even identify the problem. Because at first I didn't notice he was pushing my legs like that. It was just like, it's so fast. Exactly. But when you slow it down, you're like, oh, he's pushing my legs. What can I do? Okay, I can grab the shoulder. I can invert to the other side and stack and, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. And that's why I also think that it's good to emphasize the importance in organizing your crab according to the hip exposure and back exposure. Yeah, right? that was the so big same one. position. So he jump with me in crab, and I'm pushing on his hooks. Okay, if I'm pushing the hooks, it's gonna be really hard, right, for a, a, a John to get back exposure here, right. So ultimately, if he wants a, a quick path to the back, that's gonna usually be reliant on me giving him back exposure. But in this case, I don't, right? I'm not giving him back exposure. So John has to underhook through that space, and then only from here, right, as I'm pushing, is he able to start creating that back exposure. I feel like a really big part in that too is like taking that time before you start going super fast or live with it and just saying like, well, what's everything that the human could do in there? Like they could push, they could turn this way, they could turn that way, they could pull, they could, 
and then just try to have an answer for each of those and then test it in and, and the specific training and um, start a little slower and then build like you know they're talking about. Yeah. I think um, that's another point I talk about a lot as well is like understand that you have different training styles for different purposes, right? Like that kind of training is not to push your cardio. Like a lot of people only think of training as like, you know, okay, eight, eight minute regular round, go hard, try to win, right? They think that's training. And if you're not doing that, you're being lazy or something, right? But the reality is different purposes of training. Sometimes I'm trying to push my cardio. Sometimes I'm trying to technically develop, right? So of course, going slow there, thinking and doing all that stuff, that's not gonna push your cardio. That's not gonna make you in tournament shape. But at the same time, that's gonna make you understand the position. If you're only going really hard in regular training, you may get to the crab ride for like one second, lose it immediately because the guy does something and you don't get any experience to develop. So spending two hours one day with someone you train with in that position slowly developing is gonna allow you to get the muscle memory, the program and the understanding so that later when you try to do it fast, you can do it. And I think that's a huge concept in general is trying to isolate what it is you want to develop and understand, am I trying to get my cardio better? Am I trying to treat this like a tournament so I can see what's wrong with my game? That's another thing people confuse. People think going hard means treating it like a tournament. But that's not true. If I'm in a tournament and I'm up two points and I have the guy in closed guard, I'm gonna go slow for a moment. I might take my time, think about where the next attack is and wait until the right moment to take the attack. I won't like rush it and go really hard. But if I'm in a tournament and I'm down 30, uh, two points, if I'm down 30, that's a bigger problem. But if I'm, <laughs> if I'm down two points and there's 30 seconds left, how I'm gonna act is very different than if I'm up two points and there's five minutes left, right? So you need to have context always when you're rolling. I like to set the timer on like six minutes and give context. Okay, do I need to super submit? Am I down points? Am I pushing my cardio? Am I just doing two hours of technical work to develop? So always try to think about what you wanna get out of your training sessions.